Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome, our Hadith disciples, to another episode of Hadith Disciple Book Review. And the book we have with us tonight is called A Textbook of Hadith Studies Authenticity, Compilation, Classification, and Criticism of Hadith. The author is Muhammad Hashim Kamali. Once again, a textbook of Hadith Studies. Authenticity, Compilation, Classification, and Criticism of Hadith by Muhammad Hashim Kamali. That is the title and that's the author of the book. The general view that we have of the book is that it is a good book. It's a valuable read, it's very informative, and it's very interesting. That's the general overlook or outlook of the book in a whole in general. The book is printed by the Islamic Foundation in the United Kingdom. The book was uh, published by the Islamic Foundation. It gives the uh, information on actually where it was printed. Uh, and then here is the second impression in the year 2009. So it's relatively new. It's relatively new. The book has about 257 pages. And before we get started with our pros, our cons, our notable quotes. Before we get started with these pieces of information, let's just make a brief run through uh, the blueprint of the book. The author or the publishers, they speak about the author. Then they have a preface, transliteration table, introduction. Then he says, reception, tahammul, and delivery, adat of hadith, documentation, early uh, hadith developments, hadith literature, the major collections, biographies of hadith, ilm tarikh ar ruat Hadith terminology, mustala al hadith, hadith forgery, wada al hadith. Uh, and then he goes on to mention many other chapters which uh, reach 20. There are 20 chapters in the book. Then he gives a bibliography, a glossary, notes, and an index. So we uh, left off on the uh, employment of hadith and validation, the jahmat tadil, hidden defects, idil al hadith, chapter 10, hidden defects part 2, tadlis al hadith. Chapter 11, Conflict in Hadith, Mukhtaraf al-Hadith. Chapter 12, Unfamiliar Expressions in Hadith, Gharib al-Hadith. Chapter 13, The Abrogator and the Abrogated in Hadith, Al-Nasikh wal mansukh fil hadith Chapter 14, Additional Segments to Hadith by Reliable Narrators, between parentheses, Ziyadat al-Thiqat. Chapter number 15, Hadith Classification, number 1, in parentheses, Sahih Hassan Daif. Chapter number 16, Hadith Classification, Part 2, Manfur, Manquf, Muntasib. Maktu Mu'an An or Mu'an An Mu'an An and Mu'alak. Chapter 17, Hadith Classification Part 3, between parentheses, Fard, Gharib, Aziz, Mashur, Mutawatir, and Ahad. Chapter number 18, Confirmation and Follow up, in between parentheses, Al Mutabi' or Shahid. Chapter number 19, Prerequisites of Authenticity. Chapter 20 is Conclusion and Reform Proposals. And then he mentions the bibliography, grocery, index, etc. So that is the outline of the book, approximately 20 chapters after the uh, about the author, preface, introduction, and then uh, we said that the page is about 256 pages. So it's a moderate size book, a good healthy size book, not too big, not too small. So now, let's get started on our pros. The things that the book has uh, going its way or going forward, good things about the book. Number one is the depth of the book. The book uh, in many of its subjects or subject matter or, or much of its subject matter, many of its topics, many of its chapters is not on the surface, alhamdulillah. Rather, some issues are very deep, others are in the middle, some are just on the surface, but there's a good portion of the book that is in depth and that's good. And as we've explained before, you always don't want something that is summarized, not all of the time. Sometimes, but not all the time. And especially for someone who's a specialist, someone who's a serious, intensive student of hadith, even in English. Even in English, sometimes you need something that will quench your thirst. Okay? That will uh, quench your appetite for hadith. Number two is the richness of the content. And that is similar to the first point, but it's a bit different. Alright? There's a subtle difference between the two. In depth is one thing, and richness. Richness is something else. Number three, is the high scholastic style of the book. The book has a great deal of academia in it, 
but it led hummed. Uh, the way it's written, the topics, the style, the things that are covered in the book, in many parts of the book, are very scholastic. Number four, the hadith deals with modern hadith reformists, even if it's in brief. In other words, not only does the hadith deal with the classical terminology, the classical concepts, the classical techniques, the classical books and authors, but it also deals with these people who are hadith reformists, or modernists, or people who try to bring a new, modern, fresh approach to the study of hadith and its sciences. Number five is the unorthodox style of its arrangement. As we read briefly to you from the uh, table of contents, many other classical books, those chapters in the end will be in, uh, in the beginning. All right, so it's a bit unorthodox and that's also good. Uh, and orthodox is not always what's best. Sometimes it's good to mix things up, to bring new uh, approaches. Number six is thinking outside of the box. The author has done a very good job, and not, not in every place, but in many places, of thinking outside of the box. And bringing something that's new or revolutionary or something that is out of the ordinary, even though it is a classical uh, topic that he's studying and delivering. Number seven is the relative comprehensiveness of its content. That it's not 100% comprehensive, it doesn't cover everything, but it's pretty broad. Number eight is the quality of the print of the book. And many people may look at this as something which is insignificant, it's not important. What does that have to do with the book? It has a lot to do with the book. And that is the books of, the, of Hadith and of the sciences of Hadith and its field of study should be given care, should be given effort. It should be given uh, uh, concern and wealth should be spent. Time, energy, and efforts should be put forth in presenting the sunnah to the people in the best manner, the most professional, sharp manner as possible. Number nine is uh, hardly no typos uh, and very few grammatical errors. Wallahi hamd. Number ten is the broadness of many mentioned concepts and themes. Number eleven is the book is full of examples. He brings examples, samples, uh, and different things, specimens, to prove his point and to further elucidate what he's trying to teach you. Number 12 is the author uh, has placed a fair amount of emphasis on history and chronological order. Very important point. Number 13 is the author sheds light on a few other fields of Islamic studies, such as usul al-fiqh, fiqh, traditional Arabic language, etc. Uh, and many uh, of these sciences, the sciences of hadith often come in direct contact with and also overlap. So there's some times in which you have to have some type of usul al-fiqh. Sometimes you have to have some type of fiqh, some type of lugha, some actual fiqh to have a thorough mastery of hadith and its sciences, especially in the criticism of hadiths especially in the polemic, problematic narrations, and the list goes on. So sometimes the sciences of hadith come in contact with usul al-fiqh, with fiqh, with Arabic language, with history, uh, and oftentimes these sciences overlap each other. In other words, there are concepts that are very similar, or if not the same, in usul al-fiqh and in hadith. There are concepts that are similar in fiqh and hadith criticism, etc. So here we've mentioned 13 pros of the book, which alhamdulillah is a very good amount of pros and many of these pros as you can see are very very um, excellent and superior now let's get to the, the cons of the book things which are not so good about the book bad points of the book or sins of the book number one the author is not a specialist and uh, in my humble opinion this is a big problem it's not a small issue it's not a petty issue being over meticulous this is a big problem and we've mentioned this before in other episodes, and I believe we were talking about the translation of the Muqaddimah of Ibn Salah, the introduction of Ibn Salah, and how the translator of the book had no training, no background, just a few basic uh, points of study in Hadith science, Hadith terminology, and that's a big problem. No matter how good your English is as a translator, no matter how good your Arabic is, because you have to be proficient and master both languages to be a good translator and a good interpreter. No matter how thorough your literal skills are, no matter how much academia you studied and learned, if you're not a specialist in a the field, then you're going up a very steep 
incline slope. In most cases, you're going to leave things behind. You may fall, you may crash, you may mislead others. By translating, let alone writing a book. That's very scary. Translating a book is one thing. That's a sin in itself. Okay, with regards to the book review. But now you're making a book. And you're not a specialist. You haven't studied this science proficiently. You haven't specialized in this science. That is a big, huge no-no. This also goes to show us the major void of how many people who do have skills in high deep sciences in English don't write books, unfortunately. So that is a heavy con. That's a big black eye on the book. And that doesn't mean it's a bad book. It doesn't mean that the information that the author mentioned is incorrect, but it is academically improper, let alone from the concept of traditional Islamic studies. It is improper. Specialists stay in their field, especially when you talk about writing a book. Talking about it, giving a lecture, answering questions, but we're talking about writing a textbook, and you don't specialize in that? Big no-no. That's unacceptable even among the Kufar themselves. Number two, is a heavy dose of mainstream influence on his writing style, along with academic potential and size of the book and several attempts at critical approach, etc. Is that there is, and mainstream is not always bad, not always bad, but if you want to tackle an issue and go in depth in an issue and put forth your opinion and bring forth uh, innovation, okay, bringing forth new ideas new styles in your writing, that's what we mean by innovation, not, not bid'ah, but new knowledge or new light that you shed upon the old classical issues, then you can't be mainstream because it's contradictory. One second you're mainstream, 100% to the T, and the next second you're all the way out of the box. And you're going against the consensus, or you're going against classical concepts that are agreed upon. That's a big problem. Number three is mixing between different schools. He mixes between different schools. Sometimes the author is upon the way of the people of Hadith and what he writes. Sometimes the author is based off of what the people of Fiqh say. Or sometimes the people of Usul of Fiqh. Or sometimes rationalists or ling linguists and so on and so forth. That's a mushkila. That's a problem. When you're writing about Hadith science, then you need to write about what the scholars of Hadith say, believe, and practice especially the earlier generations of the people of Hadith, the earlier generations. And he also mentioned the benefit of the later generations, of the medieval time. But you want to place a heavy focus on what Imam Ahmed said, on what Imam Abu Zur'ah said, what Imam Abu Hatim said, what Imam Ibn Ma'in said, what Imam Al-Bukhari said, what Ali ibn al-Madini, the second generation, and before that, the first generation, and the second until the third, Shu'bah, Yahya ibn Sayyid al-Qattan, Abdul Rahman ibn Mahdi, the big ulama of Hadith. How they practice hadith, how they narrate it, how they classify it, how they pass on. And then you gradually move up. You gradually progress to Imam Muslim, to Imam al nasai And then you move on to Imam al dar qutni to al bayhaqi You go to Ibn Hibban, Al-Hakim. And then you gradually work your way up to the era of Ibn Abd al-Barr and Khatib al-Baghdadi. And then Ibn Hajar and Dhahib and Iraqi, etc. All the way to the modern day ulama, if you feel a need to mention what they say. As far as you jumping and mixing from place to place, school to school, fiqh, hadith, usul, like this and like that, big no-no. Uh, the next uh, con or sin of the book is blatant disrespect to the great legacy of the infallible system of criticism and accepting and rejecting of hadiths based off of intellectual hypothetical prosis, putting forth something hypothetically saying if, 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 and what if, and so on and so forth. In other words, the science of Hadith was a magnificent feat in the history of humanity before these thinkers or rationalists came about. Before it was academia, before it was the West, before they had Orientalists, before there was someone who was Goldzire or Joseph Schott in the UK and Cambridge and Oxford. We don't need these people to come and put their methods of criticism their methods of accepting and rejecting and it takes precedence and domination over the ulama of the Muslims that's a big problem okay so we do not disrespect them if there's something that is not agreed upon if it's something that is not the overwhelming majority of the ulama of the past and it's open for debate then that's one thing if there are modern means of technology modern means of uh, reaching a scientific uh, conclusion that's one thing but for you to take what these modern people who depend upon books 
and pins and Dewey Decimal Systems and databases for the information and you criticize and disrespect the ulama who had thousands if not millions of hadiths, names, places, dates, men, women in their hearts, in their minds those who traveled thousands of miles and had a great system before this country was even mentioned or even known of that is something that we do not do as Muslims let alone the sciences of hadith uh, number five is the lack of scholastic death and the branches of hadith sciences and some other branches the book lacks depth okay and that does not go against the pro that we said that the book has depth but in some specific detailed branches of hadith he lacks depth example on page five uh, the author totally neglected to mention uh, the ways of a tahammul wal ada which is a major branch of hadith science especially to the later experts he talks about it in general but not in specific and those points how to receive a hadith how to pass on a hadith was a major place of importance and emphasis by the earlier and later ulama especially the later ulama so that's a big problem khayran inshallah those are just the five cons from the book as we said before uh, that doesn't mean that the book is not good that it's not beneficial read, but there's some serious issues with the book. Moving on. We have notable quotes. First notable quote is, let's see, uh, the preface. The author, he says, Most of the existing works on Hadith in the English language I have seen are preoccupied with historical developments concerning Hadith and the debate over its authenticity. One finds little on the traditional coverage of hadith studies, between parentheses, ulum al hadith, and the methodology that hadith scholars have employed to verify the reliability of hadith. There is a wealth of literature on hadith and methodology and sciences in the Arabic language. The picture here is almost the opposite in that nearly every Arabic work on hadith can be expected to offer a substantial coverage of hadith methodology and take little interest in the history of hadith and debate over its authenticity. Only in recent decades, Arab and Muslim writers generally and those with a Western experience in particular have addressed issues that feature prominently in the 20th century writings of Western origin concerning the Sunnah and Hadith. The present volume does not propose to delve into historical developments as the Hadith English or the English reader of Hadith can obtain this in existing works. I have instead focused on the jurisprudence of Hadith. If I may use the expression, and we have tried to offer in a textbook format the traditional coverage of Hadith methodology. One predecessor to my work that comes to mind is Muhammad Zubayr Siddiqui's Hadith Literature that was printed in 1961, which has partially covered the subject but is still inclined somewhat to treat the historical aspects of Hadith studies, etc. In other words, the author is saying, many books in the English language on Hadith sciences, they only deal with the writing of the Hadith, conservation of the Hadith, and in most cases dealing with the Orientalists, what they said. The Sunnah wasn't preserved. They were written, the hadith were written down 250 years after Muhammad, uh, Islam is just the Quran, etc. Which is important, and which is from the deen, but that is not what he wants to talk about. He wants to deal with scientific issues of hadith terminology, hadith classification, hadith criticism, etc. So that's a very good point from the author. Then we have, uh, let's say on page 3, another quote. The author says, Usul al-fiqh and usul al-hadith also overlap to some extent, with reference especially to the study of sunnah and hadith, which is a common theme in both these disciplines. It is of interest to note that the origins of usul al-hadith are traced back to al-Shafi'i, who died in the year, who was born 150, died 205 after the Hijrah, who is also known as the chief architect of usul al-fiqh. The salamatary hadith, or akhbar al-wahid, or khabar al-wahid, was a major theme of al-Shafi'i's pioneering work on usul al-fiqh, the risala which has by common acknowledgement earned him the epithet Nasr sunnah the champion of the Sunnah. Yet it seems that neither Shafi'i's initial work on Hadith nor methodology of Usul al-Fiqh as a whole were enough to finally tackle the problem over the authenticity of Hadith. And he goes on explaining that. So he gives you some of the history of Hadith and it being written down and from the early champions, those who supported it, helped it out and pushed it into its major stages of development and maturity. Khayran, inshallah. Then we have another quote, and perhaps this will be the last quote that we'll mention, uh, which is a notable quote on page 201. The author says, Conclusion and Reform Proposals. 
In my introductory remarks, I commented on the strengths and weaknesses of methodology and methodological guidelines that the ulama have developed for the authentication of hadith. I then expounded in the ensuing chapters the salient features of hadith studies, methods of hadith criticism, subtle defects in hadith, and prerequisites of authenticity, all of which are evidently designed to ensure the purity of both the isnad and the text of the hadith. What I have presented in this book in reality provides only a bird's eye view account of the painstaking efforts of the ulama. As scholars of hadith have that they have t taken to verify the authenticity and hadith of the Prophet. The sheer wealth of the scholarly works on hadith methodology and sciences and the effort that has gone into a compilation of countless numbers of valuable works on hadith spanning the entire history of Islamic scholarship cannot fail to impress. The ulama have clearly seen the hadith studies as an arena where they combine meticulous scholarship with a sacred purpose and the results they have achieved are clearly remarkable. The purpose was to render the hadith as accurately as possible. The hadith transmitters, compilers, and critics, between parentheses, tried to reproduce exactly what they had learned from their teachers. They reproduced each word and letter, including the diatrical marks and vowel points, without deviating in the least from what they received. Zubayr al-Siddiqi, who made these observations, went on to quote Khatib al-Baghdadi to the effect that the companion Abdullah ibn Umar did not like to change the order of words in a sentence, even when it did not affect the meaning of the hadith in the least. Malik ibn Anish tried to be exact about every or each and every letter. Ibn Sidin did not approve of making corrections in the hadith, even in those cases in which there was a clear mistake by the reporter. And it goes on. Very beautiful, beneficial speech. Now we have some scientific mistakes and errors of the book. Not typos, but something that is an actual khata ilmi. A scientific error in which the author is clearly misinformed, he's clearly confused. In some places, some places he's just dead wrong, and he's erred scientifically. So let's start off in brief, page 127. The author, he says, he says here, abrogation is defined as the removal or suspension of one sharia ruling by another, provided that the latter is a subsequent origin and the two rulings are enacted separately from one another. The occasion for Nasr arises only when there is a clear conflict between two hadith and the conflict between their respective rulings cannot be reconciled nor can one be distinguished from the other in regard to its subject matter, time or circumstance. Nasr only, he says, occurs not only between one hadith and another but also between the rulings of the Quran and those of the hadith. Abrogation, whether in the hadith itself or between the Quran and hadith is of relevance mainly to definitive rulings, especially the areas of Hakam, as places of clear conflict, etc. In other words, the author is talking about hadith being abrogated. It was once permissible, and now it's no longer permissible. Or the or vice versa. Once something was haram, and then a year later, two years later, the Prophet said it's no longer permissible. We call this nesh or abrogation. The scientific error. It's for the author to say that you only make abrogation or abrogation is only made when the hadith conflict and there's no way to reconcile between the two hadith. You say, no, that's not true. That's not true at all. Rather, one hadith clearly states it came later on that the Prophet ﷺ told the companions when they got to Medina not to do this and then in the battle of Uhud he said you can do it, for example. It doesn't necessarily have to clash. It doesn't have to be a thing that is yani, impossible to harmonize between. But sometimes we have actual dates, chronological uh, proof that this came later on and it canceled and wiped away the ruling. Now, sometimes, yes, there are two hadith that clash and from the ways of harmonizing between the two is to say one is abrogated, but not all the time. So that is not only a mistake in hadith, but it's also a mistake in the sort of fiqh. Okay, so that's an error from the author. Then we have on page four. Uh, we have some very, very bad author, or very bad mistakes. The author, he says here, um, There was no pressing need for any elaborate methodology concerning the Qur'an, due evidently to the undisputed authenticity of the text of the Qur'an. Had there been accurate documentation of hadith, as there is of the Qur'an, there would have been a little reason for separate discipline in the name of usul al-hadith and usul al-fiqh would have presumably been sufficient for what it offered by way of methodology on the sunnah. It seems that the methodology operates best at a level of generalization which entails certain disassociation, etc. That's totally wrong for him to say that there's no documentation of hadith science or of the hadith themselves. That's wrong. 
Rather, if you open up that door, there are many issues in which the scholars differ over with regards to the documentation and the writing down of certain surahs and certain chapters and the organization of those chapters, the names of those chapters, the dates of all those chapters, when those verses were revealed. And we've mentioned this before. Many people who say that hadith cannot be relied upon, it cannot be taken because of the documentation, we don't know when they were written down, etc. Once you open up that door of when was it written, how was it written, so on and so forth, there are many other doors that can be opened up. So be careful if you're not ready to open up those doors. And that has clear influence from Orientalism and from those Western scholars who went to the East with many of them had bad intentions, many of them had foul objectives, many of them didn't even know Arabic. They were reading translations in French and Latin, okay, in English, criticizing classical Arabic works. Many of them didn't have a proper understanding of the other fields of, of Islam, etc. So that is false. But then on the same page, the author, he says, uh, conversely, it would also seem impossible to authenticate a hadith on grounds of methodology that may, upon scientific inquiry and research, prove to be spurious. The advice of caution that this analyst conveys is that one should not expect impervious results through the application of certain methodologies to hadith. This is another way of saying, perhaps, that the development of even a separate and fairly rich discipline of ulum al-hadith has not eliminated all doubt over the question of authenticity of hadith. That is totally false. The sciences of hadith without any doubt for the expert, for the learned one who studies them and who looks and ponders and reflects finds that this science is infallible as a whole. There's no doubt about that. What Imam Ahmed said, what Imam Bukhari said, this scholar, this issue has a different concept. But as a whole, it is masterful. It is a masterpiece that's done. There's no doubt. There is no lack of certainty that the Sunnah was preserved and it was handed down as the Prophet said out of his noble mouth. So that's another concept that is clearly influenced and tainted by the Orientalists and those people who went from the East to the West. Page 6. The author, he says... He says, the, the book ends with a conclusion and a review of modern reformist opinion on some new projects that need to be undertaken in order to purify the existing hadith literature from doubtful and unwarranted accretion, or whatever this word is, al uh, That's totally false. How can you, in the 21st century, you're not a hadith specialist, you haven't studied hadith, and the, yeah, the surprising thing on the book, uh, on the back of the book, uh, just listen to this really quick. It says, Muhammad Hashim Kamali, born in Afghanistan in 1944, is currently Dean of the International Institute of Islamic Thought and Civilization at the International Islamic University of Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. Good. He studied law at Kabul University and did LLM in Comparative Law and PhD in Islamic Law at the University of London. 1972 and 1976 respectively. He served as assistant professor at the Institute of Islamic Studies at McGill University in Montreal, was visiting professor at Capital University, Columbus, Ohio, and later on a fellow of Institute for Advanced Study in Berlin, Germany. He has participated in over 100 national and international conferences, published 13 books, and over 80 academic articles. His books include Principles of Islamic Jurisprudence, Cambridge, 1991-1998, Freedom of Expression Islam, Cambridge, 1997-98, and Islamic commercial law and analysis of future options, etc. In other words, none of his training, none of his books, none of his works, none of his academic articles, none of his jobs have anything to do with hadith. So how in the world can you come and say that your book is going to purify and purge and cleanse unwarranted things in hadith science? Well, why? That is ludicrous. And that is extremely disrespectful. Not only you're someone who's come over a thousand years after this great ulama, but you yourself are not a specialist. So let's ask the simple question. Would it be accepted for someone who studied hadith his whole life, specialized in hadith sciences, to come and write a book on Islamic law, uh, uh, Islamic commercial law, fiqh, usul al fiqh, and say that my book will purify unwarranted unauthentic, doubtful principles and practices in Islamic law. The fuqaha of past and present, specialists in Islamic law, 
academics and intellectuals who study that and specialize in that field, wallahi, they would not accept it. So why is it acceptable for someone to do that to the sunnah and the sciences of the sunnah of our beloved Prophet Sallallahu And this is not bashing the author or attacking the author, but this is what it is. And there are many people who have this approach, who have this attitude, who have this disrespectful outlook on hadith. As if, don't talk about our sciences, but we can talk about your science. We don't want that. That is unacceptable. And that is a huge, I quote, that is a monstrous academic blunder. And it's something that is very uh, mind-boggling and very strange for someone with so much academic study, academic training and experience to do and say something like that. So those are just a few of the scientific errors that we have found in the book. Just a few. There are more. So therefore, we said once again, the book is definitely something that you want to have in your library. Our, our Hadith disciples, whether you learn Arabic, speak Arabic, or speak English, or both, this is something that you want to have in your library. It is informative. It's something that can be read, something that can be explained, and uh, benefit can be taken from. So therefore, we give the author, inshallah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, three and a half out of five quills. Alhamdulillah, it's a good grade. Very beneficial book. If you get the book, pick it up, inshallah. But as we said before, there are pros and there are cons with the book. Until the next episode of Hadith Disciple Book Review. And once again, we apologize for our long absence. Uh, just you know, to let the viewers know that when we study these books and critique them and summarize them, only Allah knows it takes a great deal of time, a great deal of effort. And it's not something that's done in five minutes. We have many books, bigger books, that we have studied and reviewed. Inshallah, they will be put out in due time. Jazakumullahu khayran. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.